Uh, Ruth Allen's our head coach and trainer uh, at uh, Oakhurst Farm. She's also operates Oakhurst Farm with her husband, Mark Nelson. 20 years as a coach, Ruth, that's quite a long time. And you have many students where if you coach from the beginner levels up to the international stage. And then in 2020, you were actually uh, what, uh, voted one of the most influential people in equestrian sport in Canada. So congratulations for that honor. Uh, us at the OEA, we're very pleased to present how to create a yearly training plan with Ruth Allen. We are in January. Uh, I think a lot of people have made their New Year's resolutions. And I want to hand it over to Ruth. I want to thank you very much, Ruth, for volunteering your time um, to, to join us today. And uh, we're really looking forward to your presentation. Awesome. And just tell me with the slides when to move. Okay. Will do. Um, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate when uh, people get excited about yearly training plans. It's not something that, uh, that we think about often. Well, I do, but uh, not something that other people think about often. One of the reasons that I think about yearly training plans quite often is uh, I, one of the other roles that I fulfill is as a learning facilitator for the National Coaching Certification Program. And one of the programs within that is called Design a Sport Program. And in the Design a Sport Program, uh, we build yearly training plans on uh, a macro level uh, and a micro level. So we're going to gloss over all of that tonight. This is normally taught in a, a full day, eight hour seminar. So we're only going to go to six hours tonight. So it's totally everybody settle in. It's going to be fine. Um, so we're talking about what to train when and why. And if you have questions, I encourage you to type them in the chat. I see everyone's on mute and that's great, but uh, absolutely type questions in the chat and uh, somebody can yell at me to answer the question or I'll have a look at them when we get to the question and answer part at the end. And also after today, if you uh, wanna send me an email and ask a question uh, or send me a message on social media, I'm happy to answer anything to do with yearly training plans uh, at any point. So what do we train when and why and how do we decide on what we train when and why? So even in every training session, so an individual, we call them lessons, other sports call them practice sessions. In every practice session, it's up to us as trainers and coaches and riders to decide what we're gonna train when and why. And it's maybe easier sometimes to think of it in a lesson situation uh, or in one practice ride, uh, we know that we wouldn't get on and right away start to work on again. Sorry about that. I got dropped. That's okay. Um, so can I, am I good to carry yeah, on? You okay. are. Sorry about that. So in every individual practice session, we're thinking about how we sequence our, uh, our workout. So we're thinking about that throughout uh, a week. We're thinking about that throughout a month. And we're thinking about that throughout a year. And then on a, a bigger scale, we're thinking about that uh, on a four-year cycle would be ideal for us. So when we look at the slide that's on the screen right now, what we're thinking about is it's going to depend what we're training based on where we're at in the cycle of performance. So if we're in that performance zone, we're in show season. We're observing our performance. We're making note of it. We're probably analyzing it and interpreting it. And then we're going into planning and preparation. Right now, being in the end of January, we're in that planning and preparation for competition season. We're not in competition season right now for most of us. Uh, those lucky people down in the warm south are definitely in their competition season. So they're in, uh, they're in a different mode of preparation than us. Uh, but for most of us, we're in that preparation and planning phase. So being in that planning phase is great because we get to talk about yearly training plans. So we'll click on to the next slide. Awesome. So before we can develop a plan, we have to establish what abilities and skills do we wanna train. 
there's no point in us training skills and abilities uh, at certain times of year that aren't relevant to what we're working on. So we break those skills down into four sections. So we've got our psychological or mental training, we've got tactical training, technical training, and physical training. So different times of the year, we pray, place different emphasis on each of those four things. And we phase that through the year. So outside of show season, so right now, we're working on developing physical and technical skills. Those are our priorities. Right before competition, we're decreasing the development of those physical and technical skills, and we're increasing the development and the refinement of our psychological and tactical skills. So right now, to put it in simple terms, if I know that one of the technical skills and physical skills that I'm going to need to compete at the training level is a length and trot then right now I'm teaching my horse to lengthen trot proficiently. I'm teaching him that he's got to be sharp off the aids. I'm teaching him to do it in rhythm and in balance. Uh, but maybe I'm not actually incorporating it into a test situation. I might not be working in a 20 by 40 ring. Uh, I'm working on the quality of that gait versus actually putting it into a test situation. Coming into uh, our specific preparation period, we're going to start working on that in the actual circumstance that it's going to appear in a test. So maybe I have a length and trot across the diagonal at the end of a test after I've done a bunch of canter work. So that's where I'm going to put that into my workout so that then I'm training the tactical maneuvers. How is he going to feel now that he's done all that canter work and I go to the length and trot? Is it different than when I've just done a bunch of length and shots back and forth. So I start to work on that tactical ability to get it exactly when I need it uh, for, which is relevant for show season. So same with our mental skills, training a lot of mental skills outside of competition season and, and in our general preparation season, which is what we're in now, is more difficult and less relevant than training a lot of mental skills as I get closer to show season. So we phase those in and out. We also don't want to increase the physical workload on our horse or our body as we come leading right up to a competition. We actually decrease and taper the physical and technical skill development, and we increase the psychological and tactical skill development as we get up to a competition. We'll click on to the next slide. So if we break it down, uh, do we have the ability to do breakout rooms? We can. I hadn't planned for it, but yes, we can do breakout rooms if you'd like. Okay. Can we break this whole group into two separate rooms and give them, let's say, six minutes to brainstorm and pick one leader to jot down as many things as they can think of that are technical and physical skills needed. We'll do breakout room one as pre-training, breakout room two as training. Okay, now I gotta figure out how to do this breakout room. <laughs> That's my favorite part. I don't know if I set this meeting up though to do breakout rooms. Okay. I'm sorry, you know well, I didn't. That's okay. Um, and this is a good exercise that anybody can go through, uh, can go through on their own, go through with their barn mates. If you haven't done a preseason meeting yet with your group, uh, as coaches, this is a great exercise to go through. So actually, if we click onto the next slide, I'll show you where we get the information for those technical and physical skills. So if I'm thinking about what technical skills are required at a given level, uh, we're, we're kind of cool in eventing because we actually describe what's required at every level of competition within our competition structure. So what I would do is I would go to the uh, Equestrian Canada rules section, click on the, um, I like looking at the changes visible <laughs> version because I like looking at what's changed. But you can click on any section of the eventing rules uh, and click on to the next slide. And then once you're in the eventing rules, if you go to Annex 1 of the eventing rules, 
every level is described in terms of what's going to be required in the dressage test, what's going to be required in the cross country phase, and what's going to be required in the show jumping phase. Uh, and then you can look at the specifications for heights and speeds and distances uh, in other annexes. But this provides us with a really good resource for if I know that I would like to make a move from the pre-training level to the training level, the first thing I need to do is figure out what requirements there are at the training level. And we're notorious in, uh, in eventing to want to, we move up the levels. Whereas hunter jumpers tend to, you know, if you're a 0.90 jumper, you stay in the 0.90s. Whereas us, we're competitive risk-taking individuals. So we would like to move through the levels and feel like we're making some accomplishment when we feel ready. There's no point in moving from level to level unless we have absolute proficiency at the level we're moving to. It's not a matter of mastering one level and then starting the next level and gaining those skills. We need to have the technical skills required before we move to the next level. So we'll click on the next slide. So, yeah, that's perfect. Uh, so at the pre-training level, the technical and physical skills that a horse rider combination would need to have are broken down into uh, what we require, the dressage, the cross country, and the show jumping. So dressage, you've got walk, trot, canter, all working paces except for the walk. You've got medium walk and free walk. Uh, 20 meter circles as sort of the most complicated figure that you would ride in the dressage test. Uh, and then cross country obstacles may include, and again, this is taken right out of our Annex 1, simple banks and steps, minimum one stride, uh, a drop, ditches, a simple obstacle out of a beached or revetted water. Corner fences are permitted now at pre-training level. Two sets of combination fences of one to three strides. Uh, water can be flagged at the exit side only, and the only jumping effort permitted is one on the exit side of water. And then in show jumping, one combination with two jumping efforts is permitted. So as a coach, when I have somebody come to me and say, I'd like to go pre-training, these are the skill sets that I know technically and physically they need to have proficiency at, both at home and under some pressure before they're safe to go out and do it in a competition. So the other thing that plays into that is I know that at pre-training, Horses have to go uh, 400 meters a minute cross country, optimum speed. They're going to go for 1,800 to 2,000 meters cross country. So these are all things that I'm going to take into account when I have an athlete that's looking to move to a certain level. All the technical and physical skills required become my benchmark for what we're going to go ahead and we're going to initiate training of. We're going to eventually consolidate training of, and then by the time we get to show season, we've refined training of. So that now when I go into show season, I'm not in the warm up ring trying to teach a rider how to do a corner for the first time or how to jump through a combination for the first time. We've done that well outside show season. We've refined it. And now we're increasing that mental and tactical ability to do it. Uh, and we're, we're doing that in the show season. Okay, so we're gonna go beyond the pre-training slide. So go one more. Perfect. So at training level, uh, we've got the potential for introductory leg uh, lateral work, lengthening at trot and canter, 10 meter trot figures. That's in our annex one. We actually, the tests that we have currently don't have any 10 meter trot figures. Uh, they do have half 15 meter, uh, half 15 meter returns at trot and then 15 meter canter figures. Uh, and then cross country, a lot of the same, but now things are gonna come up a bit quicker. Obstacles of two or three elements involving banks, drops, ditches, uh, jumps or drops into water, narrow fences, maximum of two one strike combinations are permitted uh, and they must have an alternative route. Corners obviously are still allowed. And then a coffin or half coffin is permitted, providing that it's a minimum of two strides on the entrance. So now that we know all of those technical and physical skills, let's just take one of them. Okay, so I click on the next slide. So if we take one technical skill and we break it down um, so that 
And so click one more time for me. So that one technical skill is going to be cross country corners. So to do a cross country corner. So let's say at the training level, the things that I need to teach a rider and a horse before they can jump a corner, uh, I need to teach them how to have a balanced canner on both leads. That seems like a no brainer, right? Uh, but maybe I've got a left hand turn to a right open corner and I've got a horse with uh, that doesn't have a balanced canner on the left. So he's constantly falling out the right shoulder. Well, I need to fix that. I need to fix that outside of show season. I've got to be able to teach a horse and rider to go from 450 meters a minute to a balanced uphill appropriate canner for a corner combination. Maybe it's a standalone corner and I can come at 400 meters a minute. Maybe it's in combination. Maybe it's coming out of the water and I'm coming off a turn. So maybe a little lower speed, a little higher intensity is the canner that I want. So we need to have that adjustability of canner. Uh, we know that we've got to have a horse and rider that understand how to jump an angle because the front face of that corner is angled underneath the horse. And we've got to have a horse and rider that understand that holding a line across that angle so that they can clear the corner on the line that they want and land on the line that they're predicting gives them a nice jump over the corner. So I've got a whole bunch of technical skills I've got to teach before I can get to a corner. So outside of show season, I would have probably four or five distinct lesson plans that build up to doing the corner. Uh, so for me, uh, I'm that person that has the book of all the exercises that happen through an entire year. But if I think of the progressions that I take in teaching someone about to go training level uh, to jump a corner, it probably takes me a good chunk of time to make sure that all of the skills are quite consolidated. And then I've got to be able to have them do it predictably off both sides uh, over probably a knockdown corner. And then I've got to be able to have them predictably do it over a corner that's solid out of different changes of terrain, out of different turns, out of different combinations. Uh, and then once all those things are in place, I've got to now get them to repeat that performance under pressure. Uh, so now the tactical and the mental are gonna come in, but I've already taught all the technical and the physical skill. So the tactical and the mental come in as I get closer and closer to show season. So that's the how to train what and when. So now let's have a look at what is the yearly training plan. So we'll click onto the next slide. Awesome, and we can actually go one more beyond that. So our yearly training plan is like a map of your show season. So we have to have a destination and work backwards from where we're at. So one of the things I like to do is uh, we goal set first, and then once we goal set, we come back and we decide how we're gonna get to that goal. So the goal becomes our destination. We work backwards uh, to where we are right now. You have to use it to make sure that, you know, we've talked a lot about competition. The recovery of horses and riders between competition becomes hugely important as well. Uh, and then as the year progresses, we like to add in as many things as we can. If you have the best show season you've ever had, wouldn't it be great to be able to duplicate it? by having an idea of what you did to create that great show season. Uh, knowing when you did your last gallop set to have that amazing run cross country that you just had, or knowing you know, what that gallop set was, or knowing when you did your last dressage school before you had the best dressage test of your life. Um, so one of the things that I like to encourage athletes to do is a lot of journaling. Uh, it doesn't have to be intense, write a novel journal, but just a little bit of, uh, of journaling every time they ride so that they can then have a bit of an idea of what they've done to create that best performance or maybe not the best performance, but knowing, knowing what led them to the performance that they got. We'll click on to the next one.
So yearly training plan terminology. Uh, so a macro cycle is a 52 week plan of your year. And for most equestrian sports, we do work in a 52 week cycle because most of us don't have like skiing. For example, if you're an amateur skier, you would ski for a block of period and then you would dry land train or not ski. Uh, we tend to train year round, just some of that is competitive and some of that is off season. So we work in macro cycles uh, first and then break it down to mesocycles and then micro cycles. So just click right through this slide. So uh, click two more times. Perfect, awesome. So a mesocycle becomes our month uh, and then a micro cycle is a week. And every week should build upon each other to create that mesocycle. And then every mesocycle should build upon each other to make a macro cycle. And I'm gonna be genuine. The first time I heard all these terms, they just like literally not a, not a real good idea of what everything meant. Uh, once you start working within the terms quite a bit, it becomes quite easy. And then looking at multi-sport model, of macro cycles and mesocycles and micro cycles becomes really cool. Uh, so click on to the next slide. And it's just sort of a, a different view of how those look. And this also, this next slide has even built into it individual training sessions. So within a micro cycle, uh, if I've got a seven day micro cycle, I've got seven opportunities for training. And building out those opportunities for training helped me build my individual sessions into microcycles, et cetera. So click again to the next slide. So a one peak microcycle, uh, and if you imagine, uh, we're gonna look at in a minute, um, a macrocycle, but we'll look at a microcycle first. A one peak microcycle is a week duration that has one peak to it. So if you imagine, and this microcycle could be an example of uh, Sunday is competition day, maybe Saturday I'm moving into a competition venue and then Sunday is my competition day. So I'm trying to peak my horse and rider up to that competition. Uh, interesting, uh, very interesting call I sat on that was multi-sport. Um, and we talked a lot about tapering and peaking. Some sports are very new at tapering and peaking. We tend to do it quite naturally. And it's interesting when you look at tapering and peaking of riders. So if, for example, and I know, uh, I know a couple of the riders that are on this call probably ride five or six horses a day. And maybe they arrive on the Wednesday and then they've got a lot of walking to do uh, and they're probably not mucking 25 stalls like they normally do and riding six or seven horses and three of those are quite difficult horses so they're quite a physical ride um so they get to a competition and the wednesday and the thursday for them they're probably doing a lot of walking uh they're probably riding those two horses for a longer duration um and so they have naturally tapered whether they knew it or not. And they naturally ramp up to a peak by cross country day. So that becomes a, kind of a cool taper that we do so a little bit unconsciously uh, when we go to major competitions for people. So that's kind of fun. Um, click on to the next slide. We'll look at what a, a sample work week or micro cycle could be. And it differs between show season and not show season. So remember that we want to decrease a little bit the physical intensity on our horse and rider as we come up to a competition. So outside of show season, I want to mimic that uh, the intensity of a competition around the same time of my microcycle as I would at a competition. So, and these are examples. And I get people often that say to me, okay, but Ruth, this is great, but I don't do a lesson on a Thursday, so this doesn't work for me. Well, that's okay. So the idea is that inside a microcycle, I've got a little bit of a wave and a taper and a peak to my work week. So same as I wouldn't do five prelim level events back-to-back -back weekends, 
I wouldn't do five super hard workouts in the week and then have two days off. So for me, this kind of taper and peak works quite well. I'm a huge fan of the day after a competition or the day after interval training of horses walking. Um, and that walk hack day becomes uh, a day of active rest uh, instead of a day off. And then that day off, I mean, day off for me is, uh, is really, uh, they're still out on turnout all day. They're still moving around all day. They're not in their soul. So, and, and even that said, uh, they're still out on turnout. If they walk hacked two days in a row, instead of having a day off, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be the worst thing because we know that that active rest is, is a good thing for horses and for riders. Um, so then we've got that taper and peak through the whole week. Now, if we look at the Wednesday and the outside of and the inside of show season, we've got LSD in there. Um, so again, when I have parents of athletes watching this presentation, that is long, slow distance work. That is not uh, anything other than long, slow distance work. So long, slow distance work, really, I'm looking at building that base muscle and strength on my horse. I'm not looking at increasing cardiovascular fitness. A lot of this program comes from, uh, so in a lot of the program that I work within here at our farm comes from uh, many years of developing programs that didn't work and programs that did work. We are uh, amazingly short of hills here at the farm. Uh, we have absolutely just one hill on the farm and it takes about 15 seconds to go up and a 15 second uh, to come down on the other side. It's great fun on a dirt bike. On a horse, it doesn't create a lot of intensity for hill work. So we use strength training, um, which is actually gymnastic grid. Uh, and we do work sets and rest sets through that gymnastic grid with heart rate monitors on so that we can attempt to do both uh, a strength workout and a cardiovascular workout in the same set uh, with an interval capacity, but not specific to cardiovascular increase. So if this is all stuff that I'm talking and you're thinking, I have no idea about strength training, long side distance work or interval training, there is a phenomenal module that Equestrian Canada has just made called uh, it's conditioning sport horses. And uh, Hillary Clayton actually made the module and it's available through the Equestrian Canada eCampus uh, for those coaches that are looking for professional development points towards maintaining uh, maintenance of their certification. I, I'm going to guess that it's worth a point or two. Uh, it is excellent. Uh, I couldn't sleep one night and did it in the middle of the night. You just keep clicking through it and there's little quizzes on the way through. Uh, and she goes in depth into long, slow distance work, strength training and interval training uh, and building cardio capacity uh, versus strength capacity. And it's a very cool workshop to go through. So that's available uh, online. And I, I'm not sure what the, you can look it up. Um, and so then I get into show season and you can see it, the, the workload on my horse actually backs off a little bit. Uh, I don't have interval training anymore. I've pulled that out. I don't have strength training anymore. I've pulled that out. And the reason that I pull it out is because by the time we get to show season, we should have built physical capacity uh, in our horses and riders. They should be fit by the time they get to show season. They should have all the technical skills that they need by the time they get to show season. Uh, and so they're just ready to go now. So that's my aim. If I have a large break between horse shows, we'll reintroduce interval training and strength training, but probably at a lower capacity than we were doing outside of show season. What I don't want to do is increase the workload and increase the tactical and mental all in one go. It's too much. So we increase it in small chunks. We'll click on the next slide. The next slide takes so much clicking. It's so exciting. Okay, that's a macrocycle. Uh, and I believe that everybody got a copy of a blank macrocycle for this year. So layman's terms, we just call it a YTP. Um, 
all of my students every year do a yearly training plan. Even I, I have uh, adult amateurs and kids that are competing pre-entry for the first time in the year. Maybe they do three events in the year. They still build out a YTP. Uh, not that it's really going to change their life, uh, but so that they get used to the idea of planning and backward step of goal setting. Okay, so click. Oh, look at that. Okay, so the first thing you're going to do is put in your name and your horse's name. Okay, click again. All right. So those are our decisive competitions. So decisive competitions would be my goals. Those are the things that I am, I really want to go and do those. So those decisive competitions happen to be a one star and a two star. So I have set myself some very lofty goals for this year. Now, the first thing that I have to do before I can then plan out what horse shows I want to go to is I have to figure out what the qualifications are for a one star and a two star. Uh, so maybe I want to do the one star this year and, uh, I'm going entry level right now. So then I have to have an honest conversation with myself and my coach about whether that's a realistic goal. Uh, so maybe I'm, I'm competing training level. I've done a 105. Maybe I've, I've done a prelim. The one star is probably a more realistic goal for me. Uh, so then I have to figure out what the qualifications are, what the time period I have to qualify, uh, and then map it out. Okay, so we'll click again. Hey, Ruth, I have a question too, just before you get yes. on to this. So Allison asks, when in the microcycle do you plan jumping versus flat versus cross country? And so it was on the previous slide. Before we got too far on this one, I apologize for stopping you. Yep. So, uh, so my lesson days, uh, typically horses jump. And a lot of the horses in my program will have a jump lesson with me and a dressage lesson in the week. So uh, strength training is jumping for us because we do it through gymnastics. Um, and then the um, a lesson day would be a jump day as well. Or I'll set homework out of that lesson uh, and it'll be in either that light to medium day or in sort of a skill development day. So the cross country work would be like, if we're cross country jumping, uh, the cross country jumping work would be during a lesson. Uh, if we're show jumping, that would be during a lesson as well. So a lot of those are coach driven training sessions. Does that, does that answer the question? I and, and to be honest, our, our horses don't jump a, a tremendous amount. Um, they do homework exercises of jumping that incorporate other technical skills. So if I'm doing, if I'm working on my horse lengthening and shortening, I may include a jump in that. Um, but we certainly don't, uh, we don't jump a tremendous amount in a, in a microcycle once or twice. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So we'll click and see what flies in. Awesome. So those are performance competitions. So performance competitions are competitions that I need to go to or want to go to, to get a specific result that helps me qualify for my decisive competition. So if I think about, uh, if I think about backing myself up and say, looking at the requirements for what I need for the one star and the two star, then I can figure out how many performance competitions I should go to. I always build in a buffer because things happen. Um, and I can pull performance competitions out, but I can't often add them back. So it's a very sad day when you see an athlete that at the beginning of the season, they set out the goal of I'm going to go to a two star this year. And they just don't plan enough opportunities to get qualified. It's not that things didn't go as they planned. They just hadn't planned out the opportunities. Uh, so if we plan out the opportunities, then if, if things happen, you know, Mr. Snuffles pulls a shoe and he's lame for a week and a half or he has an abscess, uh, you know, I can redirect the plan a little bit, but I need to know what those qualifications are. And I need to know where those performance competitions can be slotted in to do that. So then I, and you can see, I have fairly heavy stacked in July there. And we know 
uh, July and August, the ground starts to get quite hard, uh, depending on where you are geographic for us up here uh, in Ottawa, the ground typically starts to get a bit hard. So I, I have the opportunity to pull one of those out if I need to, in order to still be qualified uh, in a pinch. Okay, so we'll click again. These are training competitions. Uh, so training competitions are competitions that I would like to go to to help me get ready for a performance competition or a decisive competition, but I don't really care about the results so much. I'm going as a training opportunity. So I may run, uh, I may go to a jumper show. I may go to a dressage show uh, in order to increase my technical skill or increase my mental and tactical ability in competition without actually putting a lot of wear and tear on my horse or without really worrying too much about getting a, a qualifying result at that competition. Okay, and we'll click on the next one. Oh, keep going, keep clicking. Two or three more times. Oh yeah, okay. So once I've mapped out the competitions that I'd like to go to, then it's important for me to think, okay, so, I'm, so now I've got to block it out as general preparation, specific preparation, competition period, transition period, and then back to general preparation. So in general preparation, which we're in general preparation right now, I'm working on that length and trot. Uh, I'm trying to get my horse to length and trot when I ask him to. I'm trying to get a good quality length and trot. Uh, I'm trying to get it when ice is sliding off the roof of the arena. Uh, so I'm working on the quality of the length and trot, but it may take me four or five tries to get a good length and trot. Uh, I may need some help from my coach in terms of what technical skills I should be using, what aids I should be applying. Specific preparation, I'm starting to bring in some of those tactical and mental ideas about my length and trot. I'm now putting it maybe in a test situation. I'm practicing my tests a little bit. I'm I'm thinking about getting it across the diagonal when I ask for it without him breaking the canner all the time. Uh, so now I'm putting it into that very specific, tangible spot. By the time I get to competition season, I've taught the technical skills that my horse needs and that I need to be a competitor at the level I've set out in my YTP. Once I get out of that competition period and I go into that transition hacking turnout, we're not just going to let the horse out for you know a month and a half and be done with them after we've made them fit and really highly tuned. We're going to bring them down a little bit slow. Maybe we're going to reduce our workload from six days of riding a week to four days or three days of riding a week. We're going to reduce the intensity of it, uh, but we're not going to let them down entirely. We're going to enjoy the fall. It's going to be gorgeous. Uh, we're going to take a week off at Christmas, and then we're going to go back into general preparation. So we'll click again and again. Awesome. So then vet work. Um, and so those of you that know you're doing FEI competitions, uh, the one thing that I strongly encourage doing outside of show season is planning where those flu vaccines go in, uh, making sure that your uh, either FEI passport or your national passport is current uh, so that you're not in a scramble right before you go to an FEI competition. If I know that my horse needs some routine maintenance from the vet, uh, I wanna do that well out of that competition period for uh, in terms of drug regulations. So I, I wanna plan that vet work in outside of show season. Now it doesn't always work the way we want it to, but at least if I go in with a bit of a plan, it reminds me to look at flu vaccines. It reminds me to look at, oh gosh, he's, you know, he needs to have some maintenance done on, on some joints, or I can't do that on the Tuesday before I go to a competition. I need to plan that well out. And then we'll click again. And that's our farrier stuff. And again, you know, we all, uh, Many of us have dealt with horses that, uh, you know, they get their feet done and, uh, you know, maybe they have a couple of days where they just don't feel like a rock star. Sir Snuffles is one of those. So we like to get his feet done outside of the competition week. Uh, so I plan that in uh, a microcycle ahead of a competition so that he has an opportunity to make sure that his feet feel really great. Uh, 
So those are things that we can plan in. And then again, along with your journal that you're keeping, uh, you can make sure that all the information that's going to get you to that successful show season next year and the year after and the year after is all put in place. Okay, and we'll click one more time. There we go. So how do we choose a competition? Um, this is a great question. I Because I teach a multidiscipline version of this, uh, very fascinating when you have a room full of non-eventers. Um, and when you ask this question, how do you choose the competition? Some of the answers I have been given are, uh, my coach tells me what horse shows I'm going to, or I go to the horse shows my coach is going to, even though they might not be the right horse shows for me, but that's where the trailer's going. So that's where I go. Uh, I choose my competition based on money, cheapest entry fees, best prizes. Uh, so there's lots of reasons that you might choose a competition. Um, so I challenge everyone to think about when you're thinking about your competition season, uh, why do you choose what events you go to? And then how does that build into your macro cycle? So uh, we'll click to the next slide. So this comes from Multisport. Uh, it's not mine. So I, I did put the references in there for it if you are interested in looking at more of this, uh, the psychology of optimal experience. So that challenge zone is where we want to keep athletes. Um, now, I'll, I'll be genuine with this group uh, and everyone that watches the recording. As coaches, it's our, uh, it's our responsibility to, to try and help figure out where our athlete is in that challenge zone. And sometimes we know we need to bump athletes down into close to the bottom of that challenge zone into that easy win section to boost their confidence. Uh, and we know that, you know, we have no issues talking about horses that, uh, that need to move up and down the levels. You know, we, uh, we certainly, I certainly have respect for, for riders that would bounce a horse up and down the levels, depending on what that horse needs. If they need a, a, a good, solid, confident run, a level or two below where they've been competing. Great. Good on you. Have fun. Um, you know, and then I think, there are some athletes that we need to push up to the top end of that challenge zone uh, to make sure that they're peaking that performance. So we want to stay within that challenge zone, but we definitely want to know where our athlete is in that. So when we're choosing a competition, what we want to be thinking about is how we keep our athletes into that challenge zone. I've had athletes come to me before and they've gone to the same event multiple times and had disastrous rides at that specific competition through no fault of the competition, through no fault of anybody else. It's just that competition doesn't work for them. Um, and they've come to me and said, oh my goodness, you know, like I, I just can't figure this competition out. And, and it gets them into that blowout anxiety frustration zone so then you say, just take this one out of your YTP, put in one that works and keeps you in that challenge zone. Um, and so we need to we need to be having those honest conversations with our athletes about what competitions work for them, why, um, and maybe how we can best simulate that experience at other competition venues. Um, so we'll click on to the next one. So minimum eligibility requirements or MERs, when we're talking about those qualifications to move from level to level, this guideline is, it, it's not mine, I don't make this. This comes from Equestrian Canada um, and is mirrored by the FEI. So uh, a minimum eligibility requirement uh, is done by completing a competition within the minimum parameters of all round performance. So, it's fascinating to me. I sat on an FEI call on Saturday morning and uh, there was a, a panel of, of athletes that spoke at one point um, along with the two guys from Equal Ratings, Sam Watson, uh, who did a clinic for the OEA 
and uh, Dermot. And they were talking about, uh, about minimum eligibility requirements and the fact that the one thing that we need to remind riders when we're talking about minimum eligibility requirements is they are a minimum standard. So when we talk about that minimum standard, that's, that's what they are. Uh, so we'll click again. So what's a winning score? And so interesting, I, I had a look at, uh, so that we ran two horse trials at Oakhurst last year. And I looked at all the divisions uh, for both of those horse trials. Okay, and this is anybody that knows me, my math skills are so poor. Um, so, but what I did was look at uh, all the scores from that and what the average winning score was amongst both competitions, all levels. The average winning score was 28.2. Now an MER, if I got a 45 in dressage, which I can get, okay, and still be a minimum, minimum eligibility requirement. If I got a 45 in dressage, and then 30 time penalties cross country. So now I'm at 45 plus 30, so 75. The next part of my math is bad, but I've done the math for myself. And then I get 16 penalties in show jumping. I could be at a score of 91 and still have it count as a minimum eligibility requirement. Now, if I got a score of 91, okay, I know I have one or two students on this call. If my student got a score of 91 repeatedly, and then came to me and said, I think I'm ready to move up to the next level. We would have a very honest, genuine conversation about a minimum standard and a standard that would keep us in that meaningful competition zone. Because a 91 is getting close to that frustration, blowout, anxiety, or, or it should be. Um, so there's a difference between the minimum standard and, and a winning score is a winning score, um, certainly. but but in that zone of meaningful competition. So actually, if we click on the next slide, which brings us sort of full circle again. So now we look back at this meaningful competition zone, that 91 is in the blowout anxiety frustration and anything under that 28.2 is probably in that easy win boredom kind of area. So it's up to us as coaches to have those honest conversations. It's up to riders to be realistic about uh, what they're scoring and why, uh, and then to go back and have a look at technical skills that may be falling through the cracks. Uh, maybe it's physical, maybe it's tactical, maybe it's mental, but that's where we want to come into that. Uh, one of our very first slides we talked about being in that performance zone uh, and then in interpretation and analysis. So then post-performance analysis becomes uh, one of the tools that we can use to find out why we're either in that challenge zone or we're not in that challenge zone. We'll click on to the next one. So first thing we've got to do in order to, uh, to build our YTP, so what I would challenge everyone on this call to do, uh, first step is goal setting. And so that goal really has to be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. And relevant, uh, certainly I would urge coaches on the call to, uh, when you have especially young athletes, looking at what's relevant, it's got to be relevant to them, not relevant to everyone else on your team, not relevant to their parents, not relevant to you as a coach, but it's got to be important to them because the only person that's going to do the work is them. Uh, so it has to be relevant to them. And we'll click on to the next one. And that is a goal setting worksheet that, uh, that we included in the email that brought you to this meeting. Um, so you can, you can use that. There are billions of goal setting tools out there. Uh, so if you, if you look at that one and you think, well, that's way too basic and you want something more in depth, I have like a three page one that goes into every phase that I can send you. Um, we have things like post-performance analysis worksheets, pre-competition uh, worksheets, you know, and uh, I was lucky enough to bring into our team a great sports psychologist uh, three or four years ago that worked with a lot of the athletes 
uh, that I have in our program. And she did a lot of development of those worksheets for us. Um, and just trying to, you know, the biggest thing is rider responsibility. You know, if you know that you need a granola bar before dressage, well, whose responsibility is to pack it yours? Um, so it, it's, it's a lot of that kind of self, self-awareness and realization. And then we'll click on to the next one. And then are there any questions? Look at that. And like right on one hour, can you tell I teach for a living? <laughs> it's like, boom, time for the next one. Well, Ruth, but thank I'm, you. I'm happy to take any questions about anything to do with this presentation. Let me know. Okay. Um, so you, you guys all have the ability to take yourself off a of mute if you want to ask a question. If you're shy and you don't want your voice to be heard on the recording, uh, feel free to type it into the chat window as well. And I can ask the question on your behalf. So Ruth, I had a question. Because, um, and your math was fantastic. I know the pressure was on. Um, I think you did really, really well. So uh, one of the things was, is like, um, I was really interested in was the, uh, the challenge, challenge zone and how you use that as a coaching tool when people are planning to, to upgrade, like, cause there is the upgrade to the competition, but like, if you're going to a two-star, but it's like, where would the, is the challenge zone based on, um, you know, what you think of the course that, you know, the cross country course or, or the, the horse trial, or is it more so that they're cross training, maybe they're doing a dressage show, or maybe they're doing a jumper show. Like, how would you, like, give me some examples. Uh, you don't have to name any of your students, but where where you were able to do a challenge per se is like they're moving up from pre-training to training, right? And then training to prelim, which like training to prelim is a huge massive jump versus, you know, it's, it, okay, two strides, you know, for obstacles. But when you go to prelim, it's faster, more jumps, and, and, and then you're getting into coffins and stuff. Yeah. So excellent question. Um, and uh, a little bit I'll put on my Canadian venting hat for part of that in, uh, in terms of what we would hope uh, from every competition venue in the country is, uh, is a standard set of requirements on that cross country course. Now we all are aware that some events uh, are labeled sort of an easier upgrade than others. Uh, I actually, in terms of upgrading an athlete from one to another, uh, from one level to another, um, the biggest thing that I would try to do is make sure that the technical skills and the physical skills are absolutely well intact um, by testing them out outside of an actual horse trial. So, uh, you know, going to a schooling day and, and making sure that all those technical skills are there by not just schooling single elements, but by schooling multiple elements in a string, uh, by setting up sort of a more stressful situation at home where they can they can run a chunk of a course uh, helps to ensure that all the technical skills are gonna be there to, to really define getting into that, uh, that challenge zone. You know, and from a, from a safety point of view, I tend to be a bit of a stickler about uh, the idea of our athletes moving from level to level, having mastered the requirements at the level that they're moving to. So if I have an athlete going from, uh, let's say, pre-training to training, before they go to a competition at the training level, I have to know that at home, in a quasi-stressful situation, they can absolutely perform every technical skill required at the training level. Uh, and they're probably, they've probably schooled some 105 stuff and they've probably schooled a couple of prelim things. Uh, so that when they go out to a competition, it's the mental and the tactical they're working on. It's not the technical. Uh, the technical skills are already intact. Uh, and I, I just saw uh, somebody posted in the chat about the 105. Um, and that's a great point. And the, it's interesting. So across the country, 
Uh, what we noticed was there were pockets of incentive programs for people to move from training to prelim. Alberta had a very interesting one. They had, uh, you got a hundred dollar bursary from the Alberta Horse Trials Association if you made a successful leap from training to prelim. Uh, and when we talked to them about it and said, okay, so if you, if you recognize that the gap between training prelim is so big that you're willing to give hundred dollars to an athlete that makes the jump from training to prelim. Why don't we just make it a more attainable jump? Um, and gosh, what do they get if they don't make the jump successfully? Uh, so that's a little bit more of a concern, right? So uh, the 105 division came into the U.S. first and and then moved north to us, uh, and it has provided a bit of a close in that gap. You know, if we take the speed from training to prelim, we've got a 450 meter a minute optimum speed at training. We've got a 520 meter a minute speed at prelim. And at the 105, it's a 500 meter a minute jump. Um, so it, it, it just closes the gap in terms of that. And, and it, it has been a nice segue across the country. It's also allowed some provinces uh, to bump up their level of competition a little bit. Uh, we saw in uh, in PEI, they their top riders were topping out at the training level because that's all they had in the Maritimes. So with the introduction of the 105, they've actually managed to grow a bigger pool of training riders and they've got a small pool of 105 riders. Uh, maybe one day they'll have a prelim. Who knows? Um, but so really my my answer to that is to ensure that they're beyond ready technically and physically before they go to the competition and then that we help them choose a competition that will best suit their their own individual competing style uh and where it fits in the show season okay yeah and i've seen some some coaches actually ride the student's horse previous to that when they do a big upgrade sometimes just to help it out just to make sure that the horse isn't the horse is ready for the student as well because we all have those moments like oh gosh this is going a lot faster than I thought I think there's lots of a lots of tactics that many coaches can use yeah yeah okay um any other questions? I know I know Elise was very excited about the 105. I think some some parents are very excited about the 105 where they're not doing the big jump from training to prelim. And uh, we do have some adult amateur riders on here. And do you have any tips for us that have to balance like full time jobs, being a parent, um, being like your child's groom if your child does ride? as well as, you know, getting your riding in, like, uh, would there be a modification you would say to a training plan for us adult amateurs that have a few more things pulling at us um, than some of our younger riders? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think uh, the adult amateurs are such a huge part of our sport and we, you know, we absolutely, they need to be embraced into every aspect of the sport. And the, you know, the, the fact that you guys are running uh, workshops that are geared towards adult amateurs is, is fantastic because they do face a different set of challenges from the, you know, the 15 year old that is going to get the drive out to the barn uh, because there's the, the help of a parent driving it, you know, and I, I, I obviously have adult amateurs that ride with me and they balance uh, that work life and home life and being an adult and paying bills uh, and balancing all of that as well. And I think the biggest thing uh, that I would remind adult amateurs of is why they're competing. Uh, so when they go out to compete, it should be an enjoyable experience. It should be relevant to them. Uh, and they need to treat themselves like athletes. So in a micro cycle for them, uh, they need to, they need to be realistic about the other things in their life that, that are going on. And I would encourage them when they, when they do come to a training session, um, 
give themselves the opportunity to be absolutely present at that training session. You know, you, you've got to leave the, the children and the work and all the things you haven't done in the grocery list and all that other stuff and really pamper yourself to be that athlete because you are an athlete. And so I think being realistic about, uh, about what their goal is and what their expectation is out of their training session. And then the thing I would, I would encourage all adult amateurs to do is ask their coach for help in tailoring that program. You know, maybe they're only going to be able to get out three days a week. Uh, and that's fine. So those three days a week, they should be out there in the most quality point for them in that microcycle. I have one adult amateur lady who loves doing long, slow distance work. The rest of us stick on headphones and we trot for 25 minutes and it is boring and there's nothing to look at. She loves it. She loves long, slow distance work. So when planning a microcycle for her, I wouldn't cut that out of her microcycle and get a kid in the barn to do it. I would let her do that because that's, that's what's important to her. And she finds peace in it. It's like her yoga. I don't know. It's whatever, but, but it makes her happy. Um, and it gives her a quality part of her week. So you want to incorporate in the things that you really enjoy. And then as coaches, we make sure there's that balance there of the, the technical skill development and physical skill development so that when they do go out and compete, they're right in that challenge zone. Um, and you know, and they're where they want to be. And I have adult amateurs that have come to me and said, you know, I, I do want to be in that challenge zone. I'd like to be at the bottom end of the challenge zone. I don't want to be scared when I go out. I'd like to like the easy win boredom side of things. That's for me. Great. Awesome. I can help you tailor that, but I have to know that first. So I would, I would say that every, every rider out there should be very honest with their coach about what they want. Um, and it's not a, it's not defeat to say, you know, I'd like to be in that easy win zone. I love to win. Oh my goodness. At, at one more person in my team that wants to win, dude, I'm in sign me up. So that's, that's cool with me. Awesome. Thank you. Ruth. I'm not going to hog the floor. Anybody else? When I was encouraging that everybody else should come and listen to this presentation, you know, um, I, I just, I thought it was important for everybody, not just young riders, not just, you know, your goal might be to upgrade to pre-training at the end of the year. Like it doesn't have to be a one star, right? It might be to upgrade to entry, but I think the plan is relevant regardless. I wanted to yeah. mention to all of our young riders, just be forewarned that I, I will be sending this, um, presentation to the young rider committee so anybody who thinks that they're going to be um putting their name in for well it won't be north american youth challenge anymore but whatever it's going to be called now you're warned <laughs> about the plan <laughs> well here's a good question so katie fisher mansfield she's just said would, it, would you change your plan a bit for you know those training a young horse or a sales horse yeah so the microcycle that I showed us uh, a glimpse of really, uh, so my young horses don't do any interval training. They don't do any strength training. Uh, they do gymnastics to, uh, to have technical skill development, um, but they, they don't do all that. They do long, slow distance work. Um, they do hack, they do uh, all of that other stuff, but they definitely, uh, I would pull out a lot of that fitness work and, Speaking of some of my adult amateurs that are competing at, uh, at sort of that entry, uh, pre-entry, pre-training level, we pull a lot of that fitness work out of there. They don't need to be right. Those horses don't need to be ready to gallop. And, and in most point of fact, we don't want them to be really ready to go gallop. Um, so it, it very much has to be tailored to what the, uh, what the plan for that horse is. So absolutely. That's a great question. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay. So I've got a couple more They're They're coming in fast and furious direct messaging for me because they know I'm not shy to ask questions. So do you have any advice concerning anxiety in which a rider has shown anxiety unless it's in the boredom zone? However, very much enjoys showing and wants to continue it. How does he stay in the challenge zone? when it's very within her ability without getting the frustration 
uh, an anxiety zone. You know what I mean? It's like, I think it's yep. like imposter syndrome. Some people have that imposter syndrome or they they get overwhelmed by fear and anxiety. And, and one of the things, and that's not uncommon at all. Uh, and it's, I think the, the first thing to do is recognize that that's, that's where you're at in terms of uh, how you feel when you go out to competition. And then the next thing I would encourage you to do, uh, so when, uh, so the sports psychologist that we work with, uh, one of her recommendations for this kind of thing was to actually increase uh, competitive opportunity in a very safe environment. So if, so you can think, uh, if we want to push that competition boundary and get into that challenge zone, it's like every skill that we have, we have to flex that muscle quite a bit. So by increasing that competitive environment more often, we actually get better and better and better at competing. Um, so uh, one of the greatest things that I learned was that, uh, small wins matter uh, and every win is valuable. So oftentimes I will take a, a competitor to a competition that I know will be an easy win for them until they get bored. Uh, so we'll do a, a few easy wins um, and easy wins doesn't necessarily mean a red ribbon, but easy wins means that they're, they're going to go out and tackle all the phases and feel really good about it until they get so confident in that competition environment that when they go out to something that's a little bit more challenging, they've got enough easy wins under their belt that, that they can go out and do it. It's like chunking quarters into your bank account. A quarter doesn't seem like much when you put it in your bank account. When you put a lot of quarters into that bank account, the bank account gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Same with confidence. Uh, so you just have to keep chunking quarters into the bank account. Great. And it's almost like, yeah, the consistency and the predictability of what a competition means to the rider. Got a couple more coming through here, Ruth. So you're not getting off easy now. They're starting to roll in. So here's, to go. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. But it's like, you know, how would you build cross training into the plan as an adult who sits at a desk every day? I can sympathize with that. Um, I spent a lot of time like that, but how would we build in cross training? For the, and I, I assume the person who asked this question was more so for the rider. Yeah. Uh, so interesting question. And what I would, uh, when you sent out the package and I forgot to have a look, did you send out a template of a microcycle? Yes, I did. Okay, sure. Everything you sent me went out to everybody and then I'm going to spam everybody else again. Awesome. So that microcycle, what I would do with it uh, for those, especially adult amateurs that are sitting at a desk every day, um, that microcycle, if you put in there everything that your horse is going to do in those seven days and maybe, you know, day off, whatever, put all those things in that microcycle and then put in everything that you're going to do physically. So the first step to, uh, to building in that cross training is actually putting it down on paper. Uh, best intentions, especially when we're adults and we've got a million other places to be and a million other things to do. Um, so build it into your microcycle. And then what you would like to do, if we think of what are the technical and physical skills that a rider needs more than anything else? So I'll give you the answer to it um, because it's part of the whole one day course that I teach called Design a Sport Program. Um, and that is flexibility, balance, coordination. So if I know that I need flexibility, balance, coordination, think of in your life what builds flexibility, balance, coordination. Uh, so it's not sitting at a desk, but it's potentially sitting on a yoga ball chair at a desk. Uh, flexibility, balance, coordination. It's building in yoga first thing in the morning or last thing at night. It's building in stretching before you ride or after you ride. Uh, there are so many opportunities online right now for online Pilates classes. Uh, and then we know that we also need cardiovascular uh, as well. So it's building that in in small capacities. And cross training, and I'm, I'm thrilled that you brought it up, 
Uh, so I did a, a YTP session in Nova Scotia last February uh, for their athletes. And what we did was we built a microcycle for the horse. And then we put in, uh, cause they did it at the Atlantic game, Atlantic game center with um, just like our uh, CSAOs here as uh, so the Canadian sport Institute. And then they had a human strength and conditioning expert come in and build chunk in what you should be doing as a rider on all of those days as well. So if you know you're gonna have a wicked hard ride with your coach one day and you are gonna be so tired because you're doing tons of two point position or whatever is your nemesis, uh, then that cross training session for you the next day should be something that complements it. So step one is build it out in a plan. Step two is actually doing it. So <laughs> I'm, <laughs> Right now, every night, uh, my husband and I have sit-up challenges. So, which uh, once I get to like, okay, when I was in grade nine, a sit-up was so easy. But now that I'm not in grade nine anymore, they're a little bit harder. Uh, so once we're up to 30 twice a day, we're gonna start challenging the kids in the barn. Um, it's That's not, amazing. Not so, but, but step one was putting down a plan to do it. Step two is physically doing those sit-ups. Okay, we have another question from one of our adult amateurs, Wanda. So it's like, for entry and pre-entry, how often would you do cross-country schooling or an event? Like, what, what is considered too much at that level for schooling and doing events? Can I ask, is it a, a younger horse that you're doing it on, an older horse? Well, I know Doug wanted to have a mixture of both. They have, they have both. Sorry, Doug, repeat yourself. Um, it's a younger horse. It's going to be five years. Okay. So I, for a younger horse, I would certainly spread it out a little bit more. But I actually, I, I like horses at lower levels to go out quite often. Um, and whether that's, uh, whether that's to a competition uh, or whether that's schooling, whether it's just going and getting in another ring at another property. Um, I like them to go out and see as many different things in a nice, safe environment as, as they possibly can. So for us, our entry and pre-entry horses and horses and rider combinations, they tend to go out every second weekend. Um, Occasionally, they'll go out every weekend uh, for about three weeks, and then they take a weekend off uh, and go out again. So I, I don't think that that's too much. The biggest thing is knowing your horse and monitoring where they're at, you know, and then same for the same for the rider on that horse. It's just really uh, if they're getting into that burnout and they're, you know, they're starting to make mistakes because they've they've gotten into that over competing. Uh, and doesn't even need to be over competing, just they're, they're put in a stressful situation too many times in a row. Uh, and they're starting to make mistakes because of that, then you've got to back it off a little bit. But certainly compared to our prelim horses, which I would not take out uh, every week, and I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't take them out every, every second week, uh, I, I would chunk it out a little bit bigger. Um, the the pre-entry and entry horses, but I take them out a lot. Thank you. That's what we really do. You're welcome. That, that's great. So I, I don't have any more questions typing into this other one, but I had another one. And it's going to kind of hopefully, if anybody has another question, type it in the window or come off mute and ask it, because this is going to kind of bring us into the end of the session. So there's like three things is like you're going to uh, do is like, you know, what should we, after hearing this today, What's the, what should we start doing? What's, what should we continue doing? And what should we stop doing? And I want it very general because I know you don't know all of us in the group, but like if you could think of three things. So what should we start doing after today? What should we continue doing? And what should we stop doing? I think Everyone's you. Silent. It's all good. I, the one thing I would challenge everyone to do um, is challenge challenge yourself to think about what you're doing when you ride. What am I working on? 
And, and how will that help me get to my goal? You know, and, and January is such a hard time to do that. Sometimes we ride around and, you know, what are we working on and why are we working on it? And why are we working on it now? Um, and that's, that's a big challenge. Uh, but you know, I would definitely, I would challenge everyone to do that. And if you don't know the answer, ask the coach you're paying, why are we working on this now? That's good. We have some people dropping off. Um, Ruth, I want to thank you for this. Um, I'm definitely probably going to issue a repeat um, of this because I think, you know, we had a good blend of a lot of our young riders and then um, our adult amateurs. And I, we had coaches on here, which is really great. And then we have the boss. The president was here today. So thank you, Anne, for joining us. She's on mute. She's talking <laughs> on mute. <laughs> but again, I, this was really great. And, you know, we so appreciate you taking this time out to, to talk about the importance of this. And I think um, the questions were great as well. Everybody, thank you very much for joining. Um, I will be sending out an email again, wrapping this up. I'll resend those documents to you as well. And uh, just a reminder, we're on Instagram. We have, we're, we're sending you emails and we're on Facebook creating events. So just keep an eye out. Next month we have Kendall Lahari. She's going to talk about what it takes to compete at an FEI. Ruth, maybe you can come too because I know you have some experience yeah. there. So this is kind of building on the momentum. Not that I'm going to be doing an FEI anytime soon, but I know a lot of these people here on the call are going to do it. And then if anybody has any recommendations for me about what we could do in March, um, I'm always open to it. So if we want a virtual clinician, um, I'm open to it as well. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. Um, it was amazing hour and a half. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. No, I, and I appreciate that you guys took the time to, to build this into your program. I think it's very cool. Oh, we're going to try a lot of stuff. Sorry, yeah. Anne wanted to say something. Fantastic. This has been a long time coming. I saw Ruth do this presentation a couple of years ago, and you know I've been wanting to do it since because it was, I just was so impressed, and it was such a great presentation, a great program, so thank you. That's it. You're so very again, welcome. thank you, everybody. Um, ha be safe and enjoy your riding. And uh, as I said, we have Adult Amy Social Hour coming up on February 1st, and we have our next one coming up in February. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Good night.